because we subtracted from us and we added it to this. So this difference factor here, that goes from France originally, has been added to this vector, and that gives us rho. So if you look at the space in which these word vectors live, at least locally, directions correspond to meaningful things. So the horizontal direction corresponds to um, the country that it's in. So as you go this way, you get to the country that the town is in. Um, the vertical direction, is that what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And the vertical direction corresponds to, it's sort of, you go from French to Italian, sort of independently whether you're talking about towns or countries. This is the sort of French to Italian direction. So your fancy sauce would turn into spaghetti, spaghetti bolognese when you got there. Um, so analogy is always a problem for symbolic AI. And the approach symbolic AI had was, well, look, um, reasoning is a logical process, and it's all about logic. It's all about taking symbolic expressions and applying rules and getting valid symbolic expressions out. An analogy, well, that's something we'll worry about later because there's clearly something a bit fishy about analogy. That's not real reasoning. That's exactly the wrong way around. The essence of human reasoning is analogy. That's what we're really good at. Rational reasoning is a superficial thing that sort of by the time you get to be a teenager, you start being able to put rationality on top of this stuff. But the underlying engine is not manipulating symbolic expressions. The underlying engine is doing analogies. So if reason was what really was the essence of people, Hillary would have won. <laughs> but the underlying thing is analogies. If Trump can make you think that an immigrant corresponds to some bad thing, um, it's very easy for you to think. It's very easy kind of reasoning. And it, he doesn't do it by sort of reasoning that, by saying that. He does it by just using the words that way. Um, so that's the kind of, that's, that's how we do our, our sort of primitive thinking, by using these big feature vectors that we've learned from data and now we can do operations with these feature vectors that are not like logical operations. They're far more compelling. And we can do them very fast. We have a thin veneer of rationality on top of that. And the rationality is very important. It can revise those feature vectors for us. Um, but you're sort of fighting against the current when you do that. That's the end. We have time to take a few questions from the audience. Um, yeah. uh, so, uh, is there a limit to uh, deep learning? For example, no. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next question is: so Have you ever tested using um, a neural network to solve a quadratic equation or differential equation? <laughs> you mean, can it come up with that funny formula the teacher at school? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, if you had a big enough neural network and you hammered on it long enough, I think it probably could, yes. Um, but it's going to be, it's not the kind of thing it likes to do, which is why you won't find five-year-old kids running around <laughs> gleefully coming up with quadratic, the, the solution to quadratic equations. It's not something that's easy for these guys. But you think it can be done this way, right? Well, we did it and we're deep neural nets, so yes. Max? Yeah. Ma Oh, do you want to pick? No, 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 no. You know their names. You pick. <laughs> I, I think he, he was the first. Yes. So, I have one very specific and small question, and I have one, another more generic question. So, the smaller one is uh, when you were talking about the map, the map of the world, they all have a like relative distance to each other. And the different direction of the distance means some, some sort of feature, right? But the map is also crushed down from multiple dimensions. Yes. Will there be a loss of information accuracy? Oh, there's a huge loss of information. And the analogy is not done in the 2D map. The analogy is done with the 100 dimensional vectors, right? Are we aware of all these features, or only neural NASA is aware of all the features? Say that again? Are we, like, uh, are, are we aware of all the features in those multiple dimensions, or is only neural nets aware of the all? No, we are neural nets. Yeah, we're aware. This is sort of meant to be a very crude model of how we work. Um, when you hear a word, you have a big internal representation, a big kind of activity. But so I'm not aware of all the features, right? You're not consciously aware of all the right. features. Yeah. 
But that doesn't mean the features aren't there and they're not affecting how you um, make analysis. Right, so my question is, when the machine is doing its artificial neural nets, they have all these uh, feature comparison, all that stuff going on, is human operator aware of all these process? Or there's just, uh, no, we don't, we're not aware of the comparison process? I'm not sure I understand the question, but there's, there's, a, there's a, a subtle point about um, being aware of a feature and knowing the name of the feature. Um, and when you're aware of a feature, you know the name of the feature. That's not when the feature is part of a big vector. That's when you're reflecting on these vectors. You have another big vector that's, that is your representation of that particular feature. And that would be itself a big vector. But that gets complicated. Okay. That was the easy bit, right? Now you don't get a little bit. Yes. <laughs> All right. Shun at the back and this gentleman over here. He's, I think he's on the back. Quick question. So, uh, if you have to solve one more mystery in this uh, neural network of deep learning, what would be that question you want to solve? Like, what's there that you don't know yet that you want to know? I would, I mean, this is specific to me, but I would like to understand how we're so good at doing shape recognition um, from multiple viewpoints. We deal with viewpoint changes much better than neural nets do. Mm. Okay, should another batch. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the great talk. Um, this might be a silly question, but um, going back to your example where you were uh, talking about the translation algorithm, um, once, and, and that algorithm, there was no linguistic Correct. So let's say that the algorithm has learned and we have a change in a good result, maybe a certain level of result. Is it possible to go back and look at the weights and from the weights uh, recover what was the grammatical rules that the algorithm used and whether those grammatical rules are actually consistent with the grammatical rules of the language? Okay, I have two answers. The first answer is no, and the second answer is yes. Um, <laughs> so, after the net's learned, what you've got in there is like a billion real numbers, and that's the knowledge of the net. And those billion real numbers are picked up on all sorts of regularities, and you can try and figure out what the regularities are, but often it's using multiple different regularities. Um, so that's the sort of no part of the answer. You're not going to get a, a concise, small model of how it works, because that's not how it works. Um, but the yes part is, you can actually train these neural networks to do things like parse sentences. So if you're asking, is the neural network powerful enough to understand the grammatical structure of the input sentence? Okay, That's not the question you're asking, but it's an interesting question to ask. Um, because if you're going to translate, it looks like you have to understand the grammatical structure of the input sentence. So here's a little experiment we did. You take a sentence in English, and then you take some representation as a string <coughs> of the parsed English sentence. So the parts of speech with brackets around that say what goes with what. So you want to convert this English sentence to this parse of the English sentence. And you can train neural nets to do that, and they do a very good job of that. So we know that a neural net is powerful enough to understand the parse of the incoming sentence. So it's got the power to do that. But that's not sort of the primary thing it's doing. So in some sense, I think these neural nets do understand how the sentence should be parsed, because you can't get the right translation unless you do that. There are things they don't yet understand, because they don't have enough real-world knowledge, because they're tiny. So the neural net has about a billion connections. Um, that's a cubic millimeter of cortex. You need a trillion connections to be one cc of cortex. Mm -hmm. And so a, a millimeter of cortex, cubic millimeter, is less than one pixel in one of those brain scans, one voxel in one of those brain scans. And we've got all the machine translation going on in one voxel, um, which is kind of amazing. But what we don't have is lots of real world knowledge. So if I ask you to find, translate the following sentence into French, the neural net can't do it. The sentence is, the trophy would not fit in the suitcase because it was too small. So when I say that, you know the it means the suitcase, because that's why the trophy wouldn't fit. 
But if I say the trophy would not fit in the suitcase because it was too big, you know the it means the trophy. And you know that because you understand that big things can't go inside small things. Now, when you translate from English to French, you have to know what the it refers to to get the right gender for the it. Because trophy and suitcase are different genders in French. So if you try Google Translate on that, it won't get the gender right. It'll be random. And it's going to be a long time before subtle things like that are got right, because you cannot get those right without knowing all the world knowledge we have. And we have about 10 to the 14 connections, and I'll bet you it needs about 10 to the 12 to have all our world knowledge, even with a good algorithm like Backlog. So our neural nets are much too small to have all this real world knowledge in at present. Um, but that's the sort of thing. So I think the neural nets are powerful enough to be able to parse. Um, so you can't say, well, it can't possibly translate because it can't parse, because we know it can parse if it wants to. Um, but that's only a tiny part of what they're doing when they translate. Um, I don't think you'll ever understand exactly what they're doing. I guess that just uh, on this. So um, people tend to uh, believe that uh, machine learning is about big data and uh, a massive amount of computation. But you have the example that Google Translate uses uh, recurrent networks trained from scratch with zero linguistic knowledge and have a better result. So my question yes, is... Yes, it uses massive amounts of data. Oh, okay. Yes. So, so it needs very big data sets of translated pairs. Okay. This English sentence is that Chinese sentence. Okay. I was, I, I was going to ask if you believe, you think, do you think that like the uh, algorithm is actually uh, mattering more than the uh, data and computer availability? No, you need both. Basically, you need 